I'm the author of um, this book, Rawhide Down, The Near Assassination of Ronald Reagan. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, as you could tell, a lot of people ask me, um, so where did this idea come from? You must have remembered it. You must have really lived this day. And no, I didn't. I was six. I was just six years old at the time. I don't have any recollection of um, the day of the Reagan assassination attempt. Actually, can I stand? I'm going to stand up, actually. Is that all right with you guys? Yeah. Um, and so I have actually no recollection of this day. In fact, I came across this book um, quite by accident. I covered the federal courthouse for the Washington Post. And in covering the uh, federal courthouse for the Washington Post, I got to cover hi hearings involving John W. Hinckley, Jr. And as we all know, John Hinckley nearly killed Reagan and three other men on March 30th, 1981. He was found not guilty by reason of insanity. Now, um, he, he's been housed at St. Elizabeth's Hospital ever since. And being, being found not guilty by reason of insanity, he gets periodic hearings to get him more freedom and stuff. So in 2008, I was covering a bunch of hearings involving Hinckley in which they're arguing about whether to let him get a driver's license to continue his kind of progress and treatment uh, to get eventual freedom and uh, to, to get more extended home visits and unaccompanied visits to his mother. And I covered this hearing. It was kind of interesting. I got to tell you, sitting just 15 feet from this guy who nearly killed this revered president was really strange because it was like someone, he showed no emotion in anything. They were talking about aspects of his sex life, of his, um, you know, how disappointed he was when he went out by himself into the community and no one wanted to talk to him. And it was as if someone had taken a mask of his face the night before when he was sleeping and put it on for the hearing. There was nothing, just placid. So I covered the hearing and moved on. Anyone who knows anything about journalism and covering the federal courts is you're really busy. And so you're writing all these stories all the time. I wrote my story and forgot about it almost. Until a few days later, this FBI agent calls me over to his office. And this guy calls me over to his office, and he says, you know, and it's to talk about an unrelated undercover investigation. So unrelated that it was about Ethiopian taxi cab drivers bribing D.C. officials. And if you know anything about D.C. government, you know, maybe I shouldn't say this can be on C-SPAN, but if you know anything about D.C. government officials, that's not that unusual to have someone getting bribed. <laughs> And so I'm like, okay, interesting, I get it. I heard about this undercover investigation. I get to this hearing, or this uh, meeting with him. We're around a conference table. He's like, you cannot write this story. You can't do this. And I said, well, you know, um, that's really interesting, but I got to do my job, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep pushing on this story. And he said, okay, okay. Well, he gets up from the conference table, goes over to his desk. I hear him rummage through a drawer, and he comes back. I'm sitting there. He slaps something heavy in my hand. I look down. It's a gun. I went, whoa, <laughs> he's pretty serious now, right? I mean... This is a new level of uh, kind of intimidation from the FBI to slap a gun in my hand. You know, it's usually you get a dead fish or something like that. I don't know, in the mail. But this is a gun. I'm like, ooh, they really don't want me to write this story. And he says, that's Hinckley's gun. I went, wow, that's Hinckley's gun. Uh, what's it doing in your desk drawer? And it struck me as kind of odd that this historic artifact should be in a museum or it should be, you know, someplace like the Smithsonian or the Reagan Library or something. And this, this gun is in a desk drawer as like a conversation starter. I found that very odd. So I went to the library. I said, I'm going to go read now. I'm, I'm not an idiot, right? I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I'm not stupid. And I was like, I, you know, so now fate slapped me twice in the matter of a week about this historic event. I got to go learn more about it. So I went to the library. Not a single book on this day. Couldn't find one. There's one about the 25th Amendment, which was very academic, and one about Hinckley's trial, which was good, but it's about the trial and stuff. And I wanted more about this day. So if you look at the book jacket, you see this guy here. This is Agent Jerry Parr, who saves Reagan's life not once but twice this day, I would come to learn. At the time, I didn't know that. I said, you know, now I'm really curious. I'm going to call Jerry Parr up and see if he'll talk to me. And I didn't think he actually would. I'm like, you know, they're the Secret Service, and they're, quote, secret for a reason. I didn't actually think Jerry would talk to me. So I got Jerry Parr on the phone, and after about five minutes of small talk, he said, okay, I'll meet you. Meet me at Murray's or Crouppen's. I think it was old Crouppen's, now it's Murray's Deli, three blocks from his house in northwest Washington. And we go there, and we have roast beef sandwiches. And anyone who knows Jerry Parr knows that once you get him talking, he doesn't stop talking. And so after about two hours, I'm like, wow, this is a great story to tell. Then I started interviewing other people, doctors and nurses and White House officials. I flew out to Denver, Colorado. And on this day, we all know what happened with Al Haig. I'm in control. We all, everyone thinks it's I'm in charge. But he's actually, I'm in control. And his kind of, his words that tagged him for the rest of his life. Well, I tracked down Richard Allen, National Security Advisor. On this day, Dick Allen brought a personal tape recorder into the Situation Room, one of the most secure rooms in the government, 
Have we all seen this iconic image of the raid with bin Laden? They're all in the Situation Room. And if you look at that picture, you see how they pixelated out. So, uh, if you look at that, there's some pictures right in front of Hillary Clinton, of, clearly of the compound, and they've pixelated them. So we can't see the resolution of the satellite images. That's how, this, this room is one of the most secure in U.S. government. Dick Allen brought his personal tape recorder in, hit record, and for four and a half hours that thing ran. And I'm the first guy outside of his small circle that got to listen to all four and a half hours of that tape. So I know precisely what happened, not just in the Situation Room, but around the globe. Because that's where everything funneled into, all the reports. Um, so sometimes it helps a bit if I set the scene on why this day is important and why I came to believe that March 30th, 1981, a near assassination, as is important historically, as if there had been a real assassination. At first I wrestled with this, like, you know, it's not, it's not as important, you know, no, he lived, no one, that's why no real scholarship has been devoted to this day. But in many ways, this day shaped Reagan and shaped the country and shaped both of them in a way very similar to an actual attempt. And in fact, Reagan's life hung in the balance of a split second, a split second decision, and a mere inch. And I can, I, and I felt, I don't usually play, there's a, a new book out by Jeff Greenfeld where he said, what could happen or what might happen in history? What if things had been different? Like what if this, the Confederacy had won the Civil War? And I think it's actually okay when a life hangs in the balance of a split second, a split second decision and a mere inch to wonder what would the world look like today if George H.W. Bush had woken up as President of the United States on March 31st, 1981. It was that close. The day starts as a normal day. Reagan wakes up at 7 a.m., goes through his normal routine, March 30th, 1981. He delivers a speech to the Washington Hilton Hotel. And people always ask me, what surprised you in this? And there's a multitude of things that surprised me. What you think about, what you think you know about March 30th, 1981, that iconic image that we've all seen of the shooting outside the Hilton on video, you really don't know. You don't know it, um, and I didn't know it until I finished interviewing more than 125 people and reviewing more than 10,000 pages of records, many not seen ever before. And th little things surprised me. For example, um, Ronald Reagan, you know, we, he read a script, people handed him stuff to read. The speech he delivered that day to the AFL-CIO, a totally routine speech, he rewrote by hand the weekend before. That taught me something about Ronald Reagan. He just didn't read scripts. He wrote them. So he delivers a speech. It's 2.27 p.m. He's leaving outside the, he's leaving the Washington Hilton Hotel, the VIP entrance. And what's really interesting about this hotel is it's like a character in and of itself. In the 50s and 60s, they built this hotel to court the President of the United States to the International Ballroom to deliver speeches to like 3,000, 4,000 people. They could pack that thing. It's a beautiful hotel. If you look down from the air, if you looked at a satellite image, it looks like a seagull in flight, the way they designed it. And the, all the facades, all the rooms face downtown, so you get a view of the mall. It's beautiful. Um, and they, divide, they, they designed a VIP entrance just for the President of the United States. It's a beautiful entrance. You go down this spiraling staircase into this beautiful holding room known as the bunker, because it's totally reinforced. That's the safety room where they take the President if something goes wrong. And then you walk down this hall of Presidents, and they have all these beautiful pictures of all the Presidents lying the wall to get the, to the, the ballroom. Except, you know, they put all this attention into it, but then they didn't consult the Secret Service on the design of the driveway. A key error. Because this driveway, you have the T Street entrance, the main entrance here. Here, if we're looking this way. So here is the VIP entrance. The driveway connects them. The driveway keeps going up to Connecticut Avenue. Well, it's narrow and winding. So narrow and winding, in fact, that the 13,000-pound limousine wouldn't be able to negotiate the turns and the curves. It might get stuck on a curb if something bad happened and they had to rush race out of there. They couldn't guarantee they could get the limousine out that way. In fact, they had a police car stationed at the top to prevent other cars from coming down at every visit. Well, back in the 70s, I guess, cars stalled out all the time. And in fact, on this day, a police car stalled out right before the limousine as it escaped the scene. And they were worried the Secret Service was nervous that if this limousine stalled out and something bad happened, the limousine would be stuck and like crossfire and things could happen. So what they did was, their, the service's um, decision, the service decided, the safest thing to do is back the, drop the president off the entrance and we back up the car and point it out towards T Street over here. We'll just make him walk in public for 25 feet. And that's safer than the risk of getting the limousine stuck on the curb. Well, 2.27 p.m., Reagan exits this hotel. On his left shoulder is Jerry Parr, 50-year-old Secret Service agent, who wasn't even supposed to be there this day. Jerry Parr. 
actually was just supposed to do routine government stuff that day, but he tapped another agent and said, you know what, Johnny, I really want to go with the President of the State because I want to get to know him better. I don't really feel like